Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I've also hit the record button, so we are all set. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lokesh Chara, uh, manager of the Arista Technical Services team. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you to the first webinar uh, hosted by the Arista Technical Services team. And before we begin, I would like to thank you all for this overwhelming response. This is the first time uh, we are working on such an initiative uh, from the tax side. Our team here has put in a lot of effort to ensure that this session is able to provide you with a great insight into the Arista EOS and Cloud Vision world. If there are any unforced errors, we do apologize in advance and uh, we'll be looking out for feedbacks for future improvements. So coming on to this first slide and a little bit about the tech webinar, quality support has always been at the center of all the initiatives we drive at the TAC organization level here at Arista. Our customers have echoed the same in the recent uh, 2022 NPS survey, where we received a plus 80 score, uh, which stands for the world-class support. Tech webinar is one of these initiatives where we want to provide an opportunity for Arista TAC and our end customers to connect outside of that usual problem-solving scenario. And with these webinar sessions, our aim is to work on knowledge sharing with our customers and cover topics in depth, which are most useful and applicable to all our customers. And for the first session here today, uh, we are actually going to cover the EOS device health checks with two components. This first session is going to have two components. Uh, first, we will be covering the details from the CLI side. And in that, we will tap the power which EOS CLI provides given the direct access to the Linux shell for our customers. And for the second component, we will try to cover these checks from the Cloud Vision side for the customers who have Cloud Vision or Cloud Vision services deployment and would like to automate things moving forward. We are starting here uh, with the baseline details and based on your feedback and interest, we would definitely like to build on the technical topics and also deep dive into specific platforms or the technologies. Today, uh, we have two of our best engineers here with us who will be taking us through uh, today's session. Uh, we have Jonathan Cartes, uh, who will take us through the CLI component. And then we will have Grant Bonds, who will run with the Cloud Vision side of the presentation. Uh, just for the Customers who are not able to attend uh, today's session, these sessions will be recorded and they will be made available on the Arista Community Central. Uh, if you would like to have a uh, reference uh, to these sessions in future. Uh, along with the presenters, we also have our technical leads as part of the panel who can help answer any questions you might have uh, during the presentation. Uh, you can use the Q&A manager to ask our panelists any question or uh, raise your hand using the hand feature, which is there at the bottom. And uh, we can unmute you and you can ask questions. And we will try our best to get to all the questions, but in case we are not able to uh, get to all the questions during the stipulated time, uh, we will follow up via email um, during after the presentation and we'll send out a short feedback form. You can put in your questions there and send it to us and we'll try our best to answer those questions. So without taking any further time, uh, I'll hand it off to uh, Jonathan for taking you through the CLI part. Jonathan, take it away. Thanks, Soki. Appreciate it. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is a, a great first experience, and um, we really appreciate the, appreciate the, the turnout here. Um, so as Loki mentioned, my name's Jonathan Cardis. I've been with Arista for just a little over two and a half years now, and uh, maybe in the industry for, I don't know, about 10 give or take. Um, and so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, health checks in the network. Um, and the, the best place to open up there to me seemed, you know, why might this be important? Um, the biggest thing to me is no one likes outages, right? So any issue that we can address proactively means we don't have an outage. That's great. Um, if there is an outage, we want to be able to minimize our downtime. Uh, we put a lot of time, effort, and finance into minimizing downtime with you know N plus N redundancy. And I feel that we should be taking the same approach to minimizing downtime when it occurs. Um, so what are some ways we can do that? Uh, we've got things like maintenance window, pre and post checks. 
Um, we always want to be aware of what configured and current status of any particular process is. Um, we want to be able to identify common issues and not just identify them, but identify them quickly. And one of the ways that we can accomplish a lot of these goals is by having a baseline for all of our expectations. And so a little bit of that's what I'm going to be going into with you today. Um, so what are some ways that we do health checks? Uh, well, there's going to be the CLI, right? I'll be demoing that directly. Um, but there's other ways that you can be doing this within your networks. Um, we've got monitoring tools. You could be using EAPI, SNMP, any number of other things. Um, syslogs, right? Either locally, right on the device, or via syslog servers that are uh, where syslogs are, are actually sent out to a remote device. We've got um, Cloud Vision, right? We'll all have Grant. He's our uh, expert of the day. He's going to dig into all the fun that you can do in that capacity. Uh, you've got AAA logs, either uh, locally or on a remote server again. And when I say locally, that is because we started introducing these uh, accounting logs in particular, starting in 421.3. Um, and we'll we'll show you uh, what sort of information those those accounting logs can provide to you and your teams. And then console logs or console servers at the very least, right? So that if we lose that out-of-band access to devices, we can still try and figure out what's going on. So figuring out how to organize this session was fun, to say the least. Uh, the best that, that we could come up with was uh, we spun up this little lab um, in uh, one of our offices, and we just kind of created a failure scenario. So there was a BGP flap. Specifically, we're going to be looking at a flap on this Arista 1 and Arista 2 devices. So this orange box is indicative of an uh, MLAG pair. Um, and so there's BGP running over this inner device link. We're going to be taking a look at that. Um, there's some show commands that you know we'll be going through. I, I list them as reference so that uh, if you don't have time to watch the video or you just want to refer back to the slide, it's all right here. Um, and you'll get a little bit more detail. Here we go on this page where we actually jump into the video. And we videoed these, figured it was going to be a little bit safer. And I actually even popped them out uh, just so that they're, they're pre-buffered. So we don't have to wait. Now the first thing, you know, obviously that we're going to want to see, we're talking about a BGP flap, right? So we're going to look at show IP BGP summary, and we just want to see, okay, you know, here's our bottom neighbor. This is the one I'm interested in. Flapped, you know, 19 seconds ago. Uh, the other one wasn't very long ago, but that's just because it was a lab. I turned it up, and so we check our log for the last 10 minutes, and interestingly, I don't get any output. And um, there's definitely logs. The logs are working. Looks like this system was just turned on. Um, so now the first thing I want to figure out is why don't I see this in the log? So we have this show logging system. And this has all of the system logs. And we can see that there's a whole bunch of information here. I mean, the, the kernel outputs alone page for several, several pages. Um, and we can use things like grep. So grep is a, a Linux function that will match a string. And so I'm having it match the string BGP and we can see, okay, hey, here's some BGP logs. Um, and what's great about this is that it gives you the ability to filter out all of that output to uh, exactly what you're looking for, so long as you have an idea of what to look for. Now, maybe you don't know exactly what to look for and you don't want to grep, you can use tail. This is another Linux function. And so I tailed for the last 15, uh, logs that are in this particular logging buffer. And so again, the BGP bounce was recent, so we see them there. Now as for why it wasn't in my default log when I just did a show log, it's because of this configuration. Logging buffered is set to errors. And so by that, we're, we're going to default that configuration out here because the BGP bounce isn't considered an error message. It's an informative message. And that's why we didn't see it in our log. Now, one thing I wanted to show here is that just because I made that change does not affect logs that already happened. So I still don't get that output in the regular show log, uh, but that show logging system that will always contain every message that's available. So if you're not finding something, it's a great place to start. It's also why we always ask for it here in tech. So back to our BGP bounce, something we want to or might want to look at are uh, interface errors definitely can cause BGP to bounce. And so there's a lot of output here. And 
just another little type two option here is this NZ for non-zero. And we'll get rid of all of these zeroed out columns. Quick way to be able to say, oh, hey, I'm only interested in interfaces that have errors. We have uh, show processes top once. And this is to see if anything's going on with our CPU. And we can grep this output as well. So you see I grep here for BGP. Um, now you'll notice when I use the grep, I lost my headers. And so just a little grep tidbit. If you add this E flag, you can match on multiple strings. Um, you just have to separate the strings by this forward slash and then a pipe. So I'm going to still grep for uh, BGP and then something in this top row so I can maintain my headers. So I'm going to do PID, right? And you'll see this is all in single quotes, double quotes would work too. And so now I have columns, which makes reading this output a lot easier. Uh, and we can see that our, our BGP processes are not consuming, you know, any amount of CPU really. But okay, so that's CPU process now. That doesn't tell me about the past. So we could do something like CPU counters Q. And again, we see that there's a lot of output here. So I'm going to leverage that pipe to NZ function, just get rid of a lot of that all zeroed out output. And here we can see the uh, COP system BGP. Uh, we see that there were packets. There's no dropped packets. So it's not that we're overwhelming the CPU. Something else caused BGP to bounce between the two devices. And so I'm going to look at the AAA accounting logs. Maybe there were configuration changes or some other type of event that occurred uh, from a user interacting at the CLI that caused it to bounce. Uh, and again, lots of output. We like to leverage those Linux functions in order to find what it is we're looking for. Um, but while you see configure here is great, it just tells me that someone entered the line configure, which isn't great. Or at least it doesn't give me additional information. So I'm going to leverage one of the ABCs of grep. Uh, A is after, B is before, and C is for context, which means before and after. And so now you see I get five lines following the word configure because I'm using A for after and five. And so there's two instances of configure here. You can see where I put in the logging buffer to errors. You can see where I defaulted it. And you can even see the show command that I ran that had the word configure in it. Um, so that means that any of these commands that you're entering on a switch are readily accessible via these logs. Now I'm going to skip over to our second device here because at least a cursory health check showed that it didn't look like there were any problems on that device. Now in this device, more interestingly, we see that both neighbors bounced at roughly the same time, right? There's only a two second difference, whereas on Arista 1, it, you know, the other one had like a minute and a half above time. But maybe that's relevant, maybe not. Uh, we'll go through our same set of commands. We're going to look for interface counter errors. We're going to check CPU to see if anything's going on with our BGP processes. Here, we don't even see it in the output. It means it didn't even make it into the top end processes. And we're going to check our, our show at, uh, AAA accounting logs again. And uh, here, you might not be able to pick it out quickly, but you do see the reason for our particular, uh, didn't highlight it, our particular. Uh, BGP bounce, there was an agent rib term terminate was entered in the CLI. So agent rib terminate, rib agent is the software process that's uh, uh, responsible for forwarding, essentially. So if that agent terminates, it's going to at least briefly um, affect all of our forwarding decisions for a few seconds while that process restarts. There we go. Now, that was only you know, four or five minutes of outputs for one particular scenario. There are a number of different health checks that you may want to perform on your devices, depending on what it is that you're trying to look at. And um, there's not enough time in a single session, probably even a week long worth of sessions to be able to cover all of these contents. Um, something that we do a lot in tech and also our uh, members of our account team, and sometimes even the developers, is write articles on various things. So each of these is an actual link. Um, if it wasn't mentioned previously, uh, we are going to be sharing the full slide deck presentation, meaning that all of these links that are you know here now, you can actually click them. They'll take you to the Arista Community Central, and everyone here is going to have access to those, uh, meaning that as long as you're a customer, 
Um, you might have to register. If you've never registered before, you just go to arista.com and you register your email address and then you get access. And so all the contents for uh, all the links that we're going to be sharing at the end of each of our little sections here are going to be available so that you can dive into any one of these topics in a lot more detail. And okay, so I talked a little bit about uh, some basics that you can do with uh, EOS being on top of Linux and what some of the basic outputs uh, or show commands might be and what they might look like. Um, but there's a lot more that we've done, specifically things that we've implemented or worked on um, to try and make your life as easy as possible. So that's gonna cover config sanities, our event monitors, um, being able to run multiple commands in bulk, either via run or aliases. Uh, I've got a whole bit on utilizing archived tech supports. So these are tech support files that we write every hour and compress them and put them into a particular directory. It's actually this directory right here, mount flash schedule tech support. And if you spend a little time getting familiar with what's in these tech supports, you can leverage them in your troubleshooting very easily. Um, combining options, right? This is one very long show command and it's a very fun one to run. It makes um, spot checking current status against a, a series of tech supports very easy to do. And then our support bundle command. So anyone who's opened a TAC case before, um, you know, we might ask you for somewhere between four and 10 sets of outputs, usually written to flash and compress. And so we wanted to make that uh, easier because it was just getting to be a little bit too much as more and more technology came out. Um, so we wrote a single command that's going to collect in a crazy amount of data. Um, and that way you can just get one file and upload it to your cases. And so we have a second video that's going to demo this. We have uh, sample commands, again, on the right, so that if you have to come back and reference this, should be very easy to do. And I'm just going to get this one going. Perfect. All right. So the first thing here that I want to take a look at is our MLAG config sanity. So this is for multi-chassis lags. And uh, we can see that there's definitely some output here. So we see something regarding VLAN 10 and 100. We also see some sort of output regarding port channel 100. And so if we look a little further, you've got uh, VLAN 10 exists on this device, right? And we see in this column up here, there's a local value of active. So our local switch has it. And our peer, our multi-chassis lag peer, does not seem to have this VLAN. So quick spot check, we jump over to Arista2 and we run the same command, show VLAN. And we see this device has a VLAN 100 instead of VLAN 10. And so there's our, our first potential issue. So these config sanities are not always going to be uh, problems, but they're at least something that's worth taking a look at. We also see this device doesn't have a show port channel 100. And if we do the same on this particular device, we see not only do we have a port channel 100, more importantly, it's designated as an MLAG port channel. And so that's why it shows up in our config sanity output. So in addition to MLAG config sanity, uh, we also have show VXLAN config sanity. Uh, anyone who's been deploying VXLAN uh, in their networks knows that there can be a lot of configuration here. So we implemented this to try and make your lives a little bit easier. We've got uh, in this output of show it VXLAN 1, a VLAN to VNI mapping of 100 to 10100. And so that means that we've mapped VLAN 100 to uh, VNI 10100, but uh, this device doesn't have a VLAN 100. It only has a VLAN 10. Uh, so based on the outputs of the two devices here, it certainly sounds like, you know, we have a typo on this particular device. Should have had VLAN 100, we typoed it to VLAN 10. Now, say you want to be able to run both of these commands simultaneously, or any two commands simultaneously. You can prefix it with run, and then separate your show commands with a semicolon. And so that'll give you, there's our show MLAG config sanity, show VXLAN config sanity. This is great for those maintenance window pre and post checks that I was talking about. 
Um, once you've got an idea of the important commands that you're going to want to run, um, you can grab everything just by copy pasting a line. Now, maybe copy pasting a line is still just too much work. You could configure an alias. Uh, so this is the same concept as a Linux alias. We just built it right into the EOS CLI. I created an alias called mlagvx. And here you can see what that configuration looks like. It's relatively straightforward alias. I give it a name. There's two sequences, so you can reorder them by changing sequence numbers. And you can add any number of commands to this list. And so now if I enter that alias, it will run those two commands. So if there's a particular uh, type of maintenance window that you do regularly in the network, it might be worth it to have those pre and post checks predefined in an alias. Make your lives a little bit easier. Okay, so aliases, that's all fun. I'm going to show uh, some ARP output really quick. And so the reason for this is because the next bit I wanna talk about is our event monitor. And so event monitor can be used to um, observe changes in state uh, that have happened. So you'll see that I clear an ARP entry here for this particular host. And I'm gonna do the show event monitor and you'll See the question mark there? I just want to list all the outputs you'll see. Um, there's ARP and MAC and MROUTE, a bunch of cool stuff. And uh, if I go to executing this command, you'll see that I, I didn't configure it. Oops. Now, the good news about Event Monitor, unlike our logging buffers, Event Monitor can do things retroactively. So I'm going to configure Event Monitor, uh, which requires you know, just the event monitor config and then event monitor for ARP specifically. And so now I can do a show event monitor ARP. And even though it wasn't configured at the time I cleared that entry, I'm still going to be able to see that output in my event monitor output. And so you'll see that there were a couple of times this was learned the, the most recent just when I cleared it here. And it'll tell you what interface it was learned off what the MAC address was, when it was added and removed. And it's going to be as accurate as, you know, more or less your, your time protocol lets your timestamps be accurate, right? Well, what's great about this is you can leverage it after the fact. And there are not a lot of features that really let you do that. Uh, so just again, to kind of quickly go through that list, you know, you've got MAC entries, uh, various neighbor events, routes, uh, STP events, like there's a, a lot of there's a very strong use case for this and you don't have to leave it running all the time to leverage it so back to eos being built on top of linux for a moment we can run bash commands right from the cli you just prepend whatever command you want to run with the bash keyword and so here we do a dfh and this just shows what our file system looks like uh, we see that we've got 96 percent of flash used now, the dir command is an EOS command just to show what the flash directory looked like. And just want to show here that for health check purposes, my flash drive is only full because there's a lot of EOS images here, right? Uh, we do a lot of testing in TAC. A lot of times we're testing one feature on a lot of different versions. Nothing unusual. Um, and I did highlight some dev loops uh, up in the above output that are sitting at 100%. That's expected. You can just leave those be. Uh, so here we drop into Bash again, because we're we're fully built on top of Linux, you can drop into Bash and it's, it's any sort of Linux uh, terminal access. So we can change directory and this is our uh, scheduled tech support directory, that tech support archive I was talking about. And you can see that uh, the last entries don't line up in time because I was rebooting. But before that, you'll see these were taken every hour on the hour. And what's great about that is you can start leveraging how counters change per hour without having to go reference some external third party, like a SNMP um, device or something that's graphing counters. You can open these files. Uh, you'll see I use Zcat here, um, but there's a lot of output. So at a minimum, I'd be piping this to something like less. That's another just Linux function. Um, and then using, um, the different ways to navigate through a large file that Lest gives you to look for what you're looking for. Um, without knowledge of what's in there, though, it can be hard. So I'm going to grep out 
all of the show commands that are in a tech support really quick. Um, now, this particular command is going to look a little funky. Uh, grep doesn't like the hyphen uh, character. It's a special character. So you have to break out of it with this uh, forward slash. And the reason we have to do that is because we prepend all of our show commands with a bunch of hyphens. You'll see what that output looks like in just a moment here. And it's a big list. I mean, it paged, I want to say four or five times there. It's a real, real big list. These are large files. So uh, it's great to have them available, but then how do you go through navigating them, especially on the CLI, right? That's one thing if you can export them to Notepad++ or something like that that gives you some search functionality. But the point of this is we're on the switch. So how are we leveraging it while we're here without having to leave and, and go to some other application? So in, instead of zcat, we can use something like zgrep possibly, right? to grep through the various counters for a particular string. So I'm going to look for show interface counters errors. I think that's a pretty easy one to start with because uh, if you're troubleshooting the link bounce and you see errors now, well, if those errors were there an hour ago and the issue was only 10 minutes ago, you don't really care about those errors. Um, now you'll see here, I, I z grep form and all I got was the show command, right? So we have to go back to those ABCs of grep really quick and just add some additional lines from after we matched on this particular command. And you'll see now I've got some interfaces that are being referenced. OK, good. But you might have 100 interfaces on your switch. I mean, say 50 on the low end and 100 plus on the high end. So what about double grepping or nested grep, right? So here I'm going to use a second. I'm going to pipe to a second grep, put in a string for Ethernet 8.1. And now I have 100 hours of history on this one interface that's locally stored on a switch by default. You don't have to enable anything. You can just go and access this at your leisure. And that can make a huge difference when you're trying to do uh, various types of troubleshooting. And OK, this is great. Um, what are some other things we can do? Um, we can reference our current counters just by so by referencing our current counters, I mean, we can use the CLI to tell EOS, hey, I want to run this command, show interface counters errors. So now you can compare current against all those historics. You didn't have to leave bash to do it. And then finally, uh, that, that long command that I showed earlier, uh, you can even write a command that will go to bash, go to this directory, look at the most recent X number of files, pipe them to this exargs uh, output where we're going to eventually cat through and search for a string, right? And so I'm just going to demo what this looks like really quick. We're looking at five outputs. And so with this one command, just copy pasted right into the CLI, and you now have access to that command because it's right in the slide deck. You can go look at the past five hours of output for any show command that's in that tech support bundle. Now, the text there was a little too big. Uh, I did want to keep it big in case there was any problem seeing it. So I'm sorry if it uh, got too small here. But I really wanted to work through what this does. So you'll see that this first section is uh, bash to do an ls of that directory to tail the last five entries. That five entries is where you can say how many tech supports do you want to look through. Uh, this is where we pass it through to our future arguments. And so we're going to do a zcat on each of the files that we find in that directory. And then we're going to use sed with, with this end flag is going to basically match on two strings. So this first one is the string at the top of our output, so the command we're looking for. And then we just stop at whatever the next show command is. And then the pipe sh at the end is actually just what runs the command. Um, and that's very much still just an intro into all of the things that, that you couldn't be doing with uh, Arista devices, with, with EOS specifically, um, because of how much we you know try and build on top of that Linux foundation. And then uh, I did mention this. OK, you've debugged your own network enough. You just want to get tax help. And you want to be able to do it quickly and not have to grab 15 different files, this send tech support command. It is. Um, I mean, you can see all the output that it's grabbing here. 
We've got agent logs and quick traces. We grab the archive tech supports. We're generating a current tech support. You can see that's kind of where we're hung at the moment. It's not really hung, it just it takes some time to actually run through this command, collect all that output and compress it, put it into a file on Flash. And uh, the total of this send tech support command does take a few minutes. So just something to be aware of. Um, I actually use a little bit of video editing magic just to speed this up because we don't want it to be taking forever. Uh, but you can see when I go into, or when I use the directory command, it, it shows the directory of Flash. And you'll see that there's a few that were generated there and that free timestamps them. So you can see the one that I generated just a handful of days ago when I was uh, doing the last recording here. And so now you can just grab this one file upload it when you open your case or upload it in response to us asking for logs and uh, make your life a little bit easier once you get to us. And that's what we want it to be. We want it to be as quick, easy, and seamless as possible. And uh, that is it for me. I, I hope that you enjoyed just the, the uh, few minutes of time that I have with you guys. I look forward to being able to talk to you more in the future. Um, there are, of course, more links because we just went over a whole bunch of stuff very quickly. Uh, there's tips and tricks, power users. Um, I try and reference each of the things that I talked about. Uh, we didn't have a good opportunity to go through TCP dump, but uh, we do have articles for each of those located here, and I guarantee it's going to come up in a future session. Um, but without further ado, I want to hand things over to my colleague, Grant Bonds. Uh, he's going to be showing you uh, some of these things from the uh, Cloud Vision perspective. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, hi, everyone, my name is Grant Bonds. I am a Cloud Vision Portal subject matter expert here at Arista. And today we're gonna be going over the health check process for one of our, our primary um, cloud and on-prem products called Cloud Vision Portal. It's a very powerful piece of software that gives you critical insights into not only your switches, but also your network. Let's go ahead and get started with the first page of the device overview. So when you onboard a switch into Cloud Vision Portal, you're going to onboard that into an inventory. And when you click on the switch in an inventory, like we'll see a little later, you'll see a page on every single switch. And this page provides critical information on that switch at a glance. So you can see of the host name, the model, management IP, device IP, and other important metrics you wanna know immediately. In addition, if you look below, we can see a system status field. Uh, these are other parameters that we have collected specifically for Cloud Vision to determine the status of the system and if it's healthy. Uh, we can see that we have our, our streaming agent, we call that Terminator. So I'll be referring to that agent later in this presentation. That agent runs on the switches locally and it allows the switches to connect to CVP and transfer their data over. There are a couple of common questions uh, that we see a lot here with those system statuses that I wanted to go over to help you use this page to the fullest. Uh, firstly, we have a couple of questions on streaming latency. So you can see here, we have the streaming latency of 75 milliseconds. Effectively, what that is, is a timestamp differential between when Terminator collects the data on the switch and then when it uploads it to CVP. Nominally, this is just a metric to show you if there's any network latency between your switches and CVP, but at large values, it can be used to potentially troubleshoot issues with connectivity. Secondly, we sometimes see negative streaming latency, and this is okay. Uh, while it looks a little strange, uh, negative streaming latency effectively says that the switch local time is coming before CVP's local time. So CVP will always be required to connect to an NTP time source. So if your switch on your network is just locally configured for a time, it may be a little slower, a little fast compared to CVP. And finally, in some of the newer versions of CVP, we've added two really helpful metrics. You can see we both have a hardware EOL and a software EOL status. Both of these metrics you can see at the bottom of that system status list will display when the hardware and software is set to go end of life so you can properly plan both software and hardware upgrades to stay in full compliance. 
this is just a, a cloud vision portal essential we will see this in our demo but effectively we have a timeline at the bottom of most pages and we have this timeline when we need to refer to version data or historical graphs so that displays this data based on the currently selected timeline and it'll be at the bottom of any page that uses it as you can see in this picture here there's a blue bar which indicates the data that we have selected and you can drag both of the handles for start time and end time to select specific times if you wish. In addition, we have some quick access timing. If you look at the, the top right of that bar, you can see the one hour, 30 minutes, five minutes, and 30 seconds if you really want to get granular. Uh, we do see this occasionally where you may not see the data you expect on a page. If you don't see the data you expect on a page, the first thing you should do is check the timeline. The generated data may have been generated before your start time. So if you're looking at the wrong time, CVP will effectively say, hey, I don't have this path, or it'll give you the wrong data versus what you're expecting. Up next is our system processes. This page displays the historical CPU, RAM, and process usage information for any selected switch. Specifically, we can look at this table on the bottom right this terminated table to discuss the uh, any agent that is closed. So this is any process that has been killed and we show the process ID as well. This is very helpful if you wanna correlate crashing agents with a spiked RAM or CPU usage. Uh, it's very helpful for us to know if you've done any pre-assessments on this page to see if we have a continually crashing program or if we have a program that crashed right before an event occurred that we need to, to look at. This definitely helps with narrowing timeframes and it can provide great metrics into how your system is performing at any given period of time. All right, up next we have system log messages. Now this is the entire system log. So Jonathan talked about how you can filter log messages out. As far as CVP is concerned, it wants all the logs your switch can give it. So your switch will stream its full syslog to CVP and then CVP will give you a nice display table for you to view these logs. Uh, it contains the, the entire stream syslog and we can actually sort and filter these logs by uh, time or message to see the total number of logs in the time range and search for specific logs you may be interested in. Uh, so for instance, we have a, a log about our BGP flap that Jonathan was discussing. We can look in here instead of grepping through our CLI. All right, up next we have hardware capacity. Uh, the stream, the switches will also stream their full hardware capacity. And so we have two views here. We have a chart and a table view, but this hardware capacity is excellent at showing you effectively any resource that can be taken up on your switch, uh, how much you've used, how much you've used at maximum overall, and then how much you have free. So this is great for planning for networks um, and provides a very nice at a glance view of many critical metrics that you otherwise may need to dig a little bit for in the CLI uh, very, very quickly and very, very easily. Up next, before we break for our first demo, is our system configuration. So this page contains the historical running and design configuration of the switch, and it's controlled by the timeline setting. So if you look at the timeline at the bottom of this picture, you can see a blue dot. So right now we're in that running config stage, as you can see at the top right, we selected running config, and this blue dot indicates a config change. So anytime you're running or design config changes, depending on what you have selected, you'll see a blue dot. And that blue dot indicates a change event. These are very useful when you wanna troubleshoot an event that occurred recently, just to check if any configuration on the switch has changed at all. And you can do this very quickly at a glance. Uh, we keep these metrics for a wide time span in CVP. And so you can really dig in to what changed, why, and when. All right, so for Cloud Vision Portal, we have some backup videos. We also have a live demo for you today. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop over to that. I've put up a Cloud Vision cluster portal or Cloud Vision Portal cluster. 
uh, on a local network. And so these are the switches we currently see in the inventory. This is one of the first pages you'll see if you boot up Cloud Vision Portal, and you'll notice that we have four switches just like Jonathan defined in his test network. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing primarily around Arista 1. It's going to be our test switch. Let's go ahead and click on that, and it'll bring us to the device overview page. So we can see that this page has all the critical details for your host name, your model, your software version, right at a glance. In addition, we can see we're covered fully under our software and hardware EOL, and our streaming latency looks good, as well as an explanation of streaming latency. So we have these little informational bubbers uh, put all around CVP. So if anything ever is confusing, uh, we want to make sure that we can get you that information as quickly as possible. But of course, if you have any external questions based on that information, please let us attack or your SE know. Up next, we have the system processes. So if we're going to look at the system, we go under processes. And we can see that we have these same page that we saw now customized for our switch. You'll notice at the bottom here, we have this timeline. So it'll default to a, about an hour. I have it set previously. This timeline will persist unless you change it. So that's to say, if I switch pages, it's not going to go back to default and you're going to have to find the time again. The timeline is going to stay at the exact same place until you edit it and swap back to a different time. So you notice in this last hour, we can see that we have our available memory, uh, our active memory, active CPU utilization, and our core utilization. On this top bottom right hand corner, we can also see terminated processes. So these are all the processes that have ended either uh, a user killed them or the switch killed them, or they've simply aged out and they're, they're done. They don't need to exist anymore. And we can sort by these processes by clicking on them. So look, look at this SNMPD process. If we click on that, uh, several things happen. The first thing is we get a timestamp at a very specific time within this window. That indicates that you're now zoomed into that time and you want to look at data just around that. We can also see the memory and CPU utilization at that time uh, with those metrics currently displayed are the metrics at that 1138.37 time. In addition, we have automatically filtered our table by PID and you can see that this PID was the PID for the process, uh, when it started, how many threads it was using, and how much CPU and memory it was using. And so this is very, very powerful as it gives you a really nice graphical user interface to troubleshoot uh, low level issues that you'd normally have to pop in to uh, core logs or other types of system logs uh, to discuss. Up next, we're going to look at the log messages. So we hit the log messages here and you'll note we don't have too many log messages, but if we extend out the time by clicking that show last one hour, we do have a couple more, uh, mostly from us signing to the switch um, and making any necessary edits. So right now the switch has been stable, what we want to see. And um, these are just the, the simple logs that we've streamed from the last hour. But if you want to go back further, you can simply take this drag, pull all the way back and drop. If you need even more time, so let's say this 5 a.m. isn't good enough, you can do a timeline zoom out. Um, and you can zoom out effectively as long as the switch has been uh, installed in the CVP. It'll show you all its data. In addition, if you want to go far in, in, in the past, uh, you can look at this calendar um, and you can look at the metrics from multiple days to weeks in the past. All right. Up next is our hardware capacity. And so this is the charts view of the table that we saw previously. Um, it just provides a really nice charted out view of any resource in the switch that could be taken up. The table is a little more condensed, so I'll go ahead and click to the table. But as you can see, uh, not only can we see everything, we can sort by everything. So currently, um, we can look at the max used, the total used, and the free. And these are very, very good metrics to have just in case you're seeing uh, warnings or alerts that you're running out of resources to confirm and, and discuss what you can do about those uh, resource limitations. So finally, for this first demo, we're going to go over to the configuration. So we have compare configuration clicked here. Uh, this is a comparison between our running and CVP's design configuration. That is to say that Cloud Vision Portal wants you to have a specific configuration controlled by Cloud Vision Portal um, when you're running it on this system. 
this is just comparing the two. If we click back to running, we can see that this is the full total running config on the switch that is easily searchable uh, for any information that we need. In addition, you can see at the bottom right-hand corner that we have a blue dot indicating that our config did update. And so we'll see in the next section how we can compare those configurations and dig into what might have changed when and why. All right, so we'll head back to our slideshow. All right. So up next is our device comparison. Uh, this is a page under the general devices tab, but it provides a critical metric, which is what is my switch configuration and how did it change? So you can compare two switches with each other. You can compare one switch at two different times, or you can even compare two different switches at two completely different times. So it gives you a lot of control over what you want to see and when you want to see it. In addition to just the configuration, you can actually compare other metrics on the switch. So we support a snapshot if you have any set up, ARP table, routing table comparisons, and more. This is very, very powerful in the situations where you maybe have an ARP uh, entry that is entering and leaving. You can see when it entered, when it left, when it left. Uh, and especially for the routing table as well as Jonathan discussed the, the potential BGP flaps if that's causing any issues with your routing table, you can absolutely see that in this section. And like I noted here, that timestamp data is very, very useful to narrow the time frame of an issue. Uh, the information that we get from this is very useful for TAC. So if you have any insight when you're opening a TAC case through Cloud Vision Portal, definitely let us know. We are always happy to have that information. Up next is our address search. So this is a global utility on Cloud Vision Portal. It's accessible through the device tab as well, but this address search allows us to do a global query for an IP or a MAC address for any switch in Cloud Vision Portal. As we'll see, uh, it returns an IP or MAC address and all their corresponding locations. But if you're not sure what IP address is where, you can simply type it into this address search box and it will give you a comprehensive list of where it is, where it's learned, why it's learned, and some really great information so you don't have to go digging in an IPAM solution um, searching for a specific IP address or device. In addition, we see that the address search doesn't currently support wildcards, so you will need a full IP or MAC address to type into that box, but as long as you know that, you'll be good to go and you'll be able to find that IP address very, very quickly across any number of the switches in your network. Up next is our device events. So these occur based on syslogs or changes in the device state that we stream to CVP. Uh, sometimes these events are just you know, looking to the syslog to determine, hey, did an event occur? Sometimes it uses some of the advanced metrics we have connected with Terminator to make inferences on switch health. Primarily, um, events are used to alert users to critical changes in the network or issues that we need to discuss. Uh, internally. You should note that this dashboard uses a time range. So instead of using the range selector at the bottom, we use a time range uh, that goes from one day to four weeks that we'll see on the page. Uh, the receiver and event configurations are fully customizable. So you can effectively create your own events uh, based on any metrics you want. So if you have a very specific use case that you need to uh, alert on if it ever occurs, you can absolutely create that metric very easily uh, and make sure that it, it both sends to any receivers you need, including Slack, Teams, um, and, and a host of other you know, webhook configurations. We won't go too deep into the configurations here just because it is a very in-depth and comprehensive subject, but we do have links on our Mr. Aristo Community Central that do discuss device events, how to configure them, and especially how to configure custom events for any resource you may need. Finally, we have snapshots. So these snapshots are just scheduled command jobs. This is similar to cron, but it's done through our Arista EOS platform. Every device will have a snapshot section, but it's going to be empty by default as there won't be any default snapshots configured. Every snapshot will have four critical pieces of data. The first one is the name. You can name that something very easy to read. And then you have the commands. 
But just like Jonathan was discussing, we have commands that are run automatically on the switch. So this allows you to uh, run commands automatically with an intent um, that you can effectively control to say, hey, I want to run X, Y, and Z every so many minutes, days, hours to look at the state of the switch over a period of time. These snapshots are very, very useful. As we can see here, we have a show version and show interfaces uh, that it's taking every five minutes. So if we have any changes to those, when we take the next snapshot, it'll be highlighted in our snapshot differentials, and we'll be able to see that uh, going back very, very far. Uh, we have a device selector. So the device we'll do, we'll just select all the devices, but if you can select anywhere from one to the entirety of your network and devices, depending on what devices you want to run those commands at those intervals. Now, finally, we have that interval we discussed. Uh, it is the interval on which the snapshot will run. It's a five minute minimum. So you can't run anything faster than five minutes, uh, but that is plenty fast to run uh, the snapshot checks as we do stream the rest of our data in real time. Uh, you can run the length of the snapshot pretty much as long as you want it. Uh, we have a metrics for minutes, hours, and days. So you could run it for you know once a year, once every six months is absolutely feasible within this snapshot configuration. All right. So we'll go ahead and go to part two of our live demo. The first thing we're going to look at is the device comparison. There are several ways to get to it. Uh, what we're going to use, we're just going to click on the devices tab, and we're going to look over here at comparison. And so you can see this is the same screen we saw. We can compare two devices two times or two devices at two different times. Specifically, we'll just select Arista 1. We'll select two times as well. Um, and we have a couple quick links here similar to our timeline. You'll notice there's no timeline here currently as we need to, to select a time before we uh, discuss any uh, timing. So we'll do one hour ago and we can compare. So we'll notice that we have a device at that time, approximately an hour before, and we have a device at current time. So that's the left-hand or right-hand column respectively. And this just shows some basic information. But if you look on the right, we have a lot of information uh, that we provide that is very, very critical, especially if you know uh, the general time in which an event occurred. Specifically, we're going to look at configuration. We can see that from an hour ago, nothing changed. Uh, but potentially, if you go back a day, there we go. So we have added uh, a description line to one of our interfaces. Scroll down here. We can see that that test description was added um, between that day and current time, when we can see that little blue dot actually uh, was the exact time that we created it back in our uh, device configuration page. Up next, we have address search. So we'll head back out of here. Uh, there are two ways to get to it. My favorite uh, is using this global search. So this search is different than address search, but it is very, very powerful. You can search for uh, settings. You can search for pages. So specifically, let's search for address search. And, and in our metrics, we'll head back to our devices, and then we'll look at specifically, it, it's called endpoint search. Uh, address search is a, another name for it. Uh, but you can look here. We actually search for endpoints or devices. So what we'll do. So go to our inventory. We'll just use this Arista One management IP address as an example. Go back to our endpoint search, and we'll paste it in here. So when we hit Enter, we'll let it search through. And we can see that we have our IP address and then where it's most likely learned. We do have other locations. So we can see it was also learned via uh, port channel on this interface. Um, but it'll give you the most relevant information first so that you have that uh, immediately. Specifically, we can see that we have our inventory device, uh, this is its management IP, and then all the quick links you can go to give you immediate access to telemetry. You can look at its details, you can look at its topology, you can view traffic flows. So this is a very, very powerful tool that allows you to leverage multiple systems combined into a really uh, nice and clean GUI. Um, to help troubleshoot any issues that you may be uh, seeing in your, in your network or looking through um, in Arista metrics. Up next, we have our events tab. So we're going to move out of the devices tab. We're going to head into the events tab. And this particular events tab um, is very similar to the one we saw on our slide. 
you can see right now I have the time range set for two weeks as our switches have been pretty quiet. Uh, but six days ago, you can see that we do have some BGP state changes as, as well as uh, effectively any event that we uh, collect, especially critical ones. We can see that we had a link down that went unexpectedly. Um, we didn't input power loss. These metrics are very, very important as uh, looking at an entire network, you may want to look at devices that um, are, are powering down on effect unexpectedly, where the links are going down unexpectedly, where you want to make sure that all your devices are healthy uh, to determine if there are any potential problems before it gets to an issue uh, that could be greater in the network. Up at the top right, we can configure our event generation notification. Like I said, I won't go too deep into this because it could be its entire series just on its own. Um, but if you are interested in that, please let us know in the feedback and um, we will absolutely have information on that as well. Finally, we have our snapshots. So these are those cron effective cron jobs that we run. We're gonna go over to provisioning and we're gonna click on snapshot configuration. I know that it loaded up because I had it selected. Um, and this is our very simple snapshot page. We're gonna select new snapshot here. We're gonna give it a name. In this case, we'll call it test. And we're gonna run a couple EOS commands. Specifically, we'll just run show versions. That's the easiest to run and a really nice output. And then we'll select our devices. So in this case, we're gonna select all devices, but if you wanted to, you really could select one or two. Um, selecting all just gives us a convenience of being able to run it across the entire network simultaneously to get that great picture of what's happening at any given time. We have our capture interval. So right now it's set to five minutes. You can also see that we have hours and days if you wanna extend that out by default as well. If you select a snapshot configuration that is you know, multiple days long or multiple weeks long, uh, it will run automatically once. So you know if it's valid and you're getting the output you expect. Um, so even if you have that setting for, for a long period of time, you'll be able to see the initial output to know if you wanna change it before you have to wait those, those several days. We'll go ahead and save this. And as soon as we save it, we hit our validity tests, they're valid. And we'll just click on the Arista One device to look at it. And so it'll auto load us into the snapshot section uh, the app is very effective at getting you different places through links. And this is one of those examples. If we click on this test, we can see that we have the test, we have the date time for the test, and then we have the output of this snapshot. And so if we had more snapshots that we were running in the past, we can actually compare snapshots. We can look at different metrics at different times. Um, and it gives us a, a set way of instead of taking the data continually, maybe looking to it that way, just yet another way to look at the data depending on your use case and depending on your topology for what you have set up for it. All right. And so with that, that is the end of our Cloud Vision Portal section. Uh, it was, thank you for, for coming out and I hope this was uh, helpful in discussing both what our CLI and Cloud Vision Portal can bring to the table to help you look at issues, to look at your network, and really get that deep dive on telemetry so you can hit issues before they become a, a big problem and uh, save yourselves a lot of time and hopefully money. Alokesh, I'll pass it back to you for any questions and answers. Awesome, perfect. Thank you, Grant. Um, and uh, thank you, Grant, Jonathan, uh, both of you uh, for covering this topic in detail. Uh, some really good uh, technical stuff there. Uh, and we really hope this session was useful for everyone uh, who attended. Uh, and just to let everyone know, uh, the recording of these sessions will be available on the ERISA community page, um, along with the presentation reference material and the questions what we covered. There was some really good material in the uh, QA section as well. Uh, we will actually have, uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Grant. Um, we will actually have two more sessions uh, upcoming. Um, you know, uh, we have session two and session three, where we will actually walk through the EOS device upgrades and the scheduled reload scenarios, uh, which can help you uh, plan uh, your upgrade or maintenance windows uh, effectively. Uh, along with that, uh, after this session, we will also send out a short feedback form with two to three questions. So if you can, please take some time to provide the feedback as we definitely intend to use it uh, for our future sessions. And with that, uh, I'm going to keep the webinar open now to answer any questions what you may have. Uh, you can use the Q&A section or uh, you can raise your hand.
hand and I can unmute and we can ask your question live. So just going to leave it open for now, uh, for next, uh, you know, uh, five to 10 minutes, if you have any questions. I think uh, uh, we have technical needs. So, so there's a question, I think, can you monitor route drops from BGP? And I think um, if anyone from the technical leads wanna take this question, but we do have uh, event monitor for the BGP, which can definitely assist you with this particular objective. Uh, anything else we wanna add to that? Okay. I think Upasana is going to write an uh, uh, answer to that question. Okay. Any other questions? I think there's another question. Grant, uh, do you want to take this question? If when you onboard the device into CVP, does it at all change the config or affect the availability in the onboarding process? I don't think that does. Uh, you can onboard the device as is. Uh, but any other thing, Grant, you want to add to that? Uh, nope, that, that's a great answer. Yeah, so CVP or Cloud Vision Portal will not change your device at all. We have a very, very strict change control process that involves several steps to make sure that we never are accidentally changing something. Uh, any device changes will be very, very specific and have to be, uh, like I said, multiple steps of um, approval before you can, can through that, uh, mainly because, like you said, we don't want to uh, change something right up from under the device if it's running in production. So yeah, that, that config change, um, will be planned only, and it won't affect the availability of the device at all. Uh, the Terminator agent just sits on top of the switch and streaming data to CVP. It's very lightweight for uh, a vast majority of our switches, so it's um, absolutely not impacting. Um, yep, and that's, that's, that's pretty much on that one. But yeah, great question. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, does Arista EOS or CVP has functions to do packet captures for troubleshooting? Yes, we do. Uh, we do have TCP dump inbuilt with, uh, by default, you can capture uh, control plane packets. And uh, I think if you want to ca uh, capture the data plane packets, our platforms do provide the monitor session capability where you can run the control plane, uh, data plane packets to the CPU and also visualize those packets live as uh, for the troubleshooting purposes. So that's that. Can I add on to that one real quick too, Loki? Yes, please, because, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Awesome. I, I mean, you covered the two points. Um, you can do control plane captures really easily just by TCP dump at the CLI. Um, you can do data plane captures using mirror to CPU functionality. Um, that is a little bit limited depending on platform and the version of code that you're running. Um, but for the most part, it is generally available. You just have to go and check out some specifics. Um, and I, I say that specifically because we uh, did include links to articles that cover um, a couple of different TCP dump scenarios, um, including some of the baseline expectations of um, uh, uh, what you need to be running in order for it to work, like versions of code or hardware platform. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, there's even an article on um, how to stream TCP dump directly to your laptop. Uh, and it just covers a, a or, or desktop, right? Your personal computer. Um, and it was just a, a fun article that was wrote, uh, written, I think, by someone from the accounts team, but um, it was interesting, and I, I made sure to include it uh, right in the links. So it's it's definitely available. Um, links are included in the um, uh, slide deck to further talk on those topics, because it can get detailed. Perfect. Thank you. And I think with that, uh, we are pretty much at the top of the hour, but... Uh... Yes, um, we do have, uh, uh, you know, COP uh, basically policy protecting the CPU. So uh, you can pretty much like, you know, from the CPU protection, we have all the functionality set into the US, which will uh, definitely protect the CPU if you're running the uh, uh, data plane traffic, you're punting it to the CPU. So we do have that, yes. Along with um, 
filtering just because so once you hit cop you're going to drop all of the other packets so again platform and eos version dependent um you can apply additional filtering so that you're only punting certain packets to the cpu in some cases right. so that uh, you can work around cop limitations on links that have a lot of traffic okay perfect uh I think there's one last question I think we can take at this point. Uh, Grant, do you want to take that? Like, does CVP provide a means to forward telemetry data collected from the device to an external monitoring system? And so we have ways that you can collect that data yeah. as well. I believe we have our um, the, the OpenFlow GNMI, uh, like I yeah. said, platform and switch independent or dependent. But we do have uh, ways that we can collect telemetry data and forward them as well. Um, primarily through third party libraries and applications that, that we've developed, um, or just open source tools. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Perfect. I think we pretty much, uh, sort of answered any, uh, all the questions. If there are any other questions, please feel free to send us an email to support at Orissa and we'll be happy to assist you with any questions, what we were not able to cover dur during the, um, uh, during this webinar session. And I think uh, with that, uh, we will uh, go ahead. I think there are uh, one or two other questions. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, we are all good. Uh, Thomas, are you going to take that question? I think that there's one uh, answer you were actually writing. Yeah, so um, there's a great article on Cloud Vision APIs on our community portal. So please check that out. I can paste that very quickly into the uh chat window okay. one second um in the meantime are there other questions yeah so cvp can can collect telemetry info for from other devices uh using open config and snmp and uh we are make we are uh working on making that experience even better for now you would have had to use uh the cli and configure yaml file to um, you know, add some connectivity information there on how to reach out to those third-party devices. Um, and uh, very soon we'll have a neat UI. Uh, so you'll be able to, to do that from the UI. So stay tuned. Uh, and in the meantime, you can you know, reach out to us and we can help you with a, a demo. Uh, and let me find the API guide. Yeah, so uh, there was that question. Yep, so I just uh, 